So now we're gonna move over to the long read sequencers. We're gonna start with Oxford nanopore sequencing. And with this sequencing technology, it uses these nanopores, which are extremely small pores with really small gaps in them. So in this case, 1.8 nanometers that are embedded in lipid membranes. These lipid membranes act as a barrier that prevent currents from going back and forth. So currents have to pass through the pore. And the way the nanopore sequencer works is single-stranded DNA, or even RNA in this case now, are threaded through the pore. And depending on which bases are in the pore at a given moment, that changes the current that's read out. And detectors can measure this change in current. And over here is just a depiction of what this looks like. So for instance, you might have a similar, uh, one level of current for your T's, a different ones for G's, uh, something else for C's, and then another level of current for A's. And you can just measure these current traces over time and build a sequence. In reality, the traces don't look this clean because in the pore, they're actually up to six bases at a time present. And with six bases times four different possible bases for your A, C's, G's, and T's, uh, this generates up to 4,000 different possible states. And so it was really a technical tour de force to get this to work. But today, um, you can get this to work. Uh, you can buy these systems. And they do have high error rates, anywhere from 10 to 15%. And these errors tend to be biased. But you can get really, really long reads. The current record is a two megabase or two million base read from a single piece of DNA. And again, as I mentioned, you can now directly sequence RNA, so you don't have to convert that to DNA. And there are even possibilities of sequencing proteins in the future, which will be very exciting. The other benefit of the Oxford Nanopore system is that it's extremely portable. You can see this scientist is actually doing some sequencing out in the field. This looks like a jungle somewhere in the world. You can see the foliage in the back. So there's a laptop run to the sequencer, and the sequencer is actually the small device that uh, the scientist is pipetting into. It's really the size of, uh, of a small remote control, and it's powered by the computer that it's attached to. So it means you can really take sequencing anywhere in the world. These systems have even been taken up to the International Space Station uh, for sequencing in space. So the last technology I'm gonna to talk to you about today is specific biosequencing. And this is another sequencing by synthesis method. And it uses building blocks similar to traditional Sanger sequencing and Lumina sequencing, but they're slightly different. So down here, I'm showing you uh, an A base from the Pacific biosequencer. And you'll notice first, there's no block on 3'-hydroxyl end. This means that once this gets incorporated, another base can get incorporated right away. And then the fluorescent group is actually attached to the phosphates. And these phosphates actually uh, are removed once a base is incorporated. This means that this fluorescent group, once it gets incorporated into a DNA strand, will float away from the DNA strand. So this means that we don't have to do separate chemistry to enable the reaction to proceed. This happens in, in real time. And on the instrument, uh, there's a really, really uh, tiny array of wells um, into, in a plate. And these wells are only about 100 nanometers in height. At the bottom of each of these wells is a DNA polymerase. And what happens is a template molecule uh, is bound to the polymerase, and then it starts incorporating those modified bases. And there's a camera at the bottom that's taking the video that's monitoring this reaction in real time. So remember, we have four different bases that have four different colors, and these bases are flowing in and out of this well really, really quickly. And so you get a signal uh, that's uh, just kind of very noisy. You don't really see anything happening. But when the proper base is bound to the polymerase and matches the template, it actually dwells there for a certain amount of time. It's really a split second. Uh, but that split second gets recorded by the video, and you see this bump up and the fluorescent signal, in this case, blue, uh, which is the G base. And so once the incorporation occurs, the phosphates leave, and the fluorescent group that attached to the phosphates also leaves, and resulting in the signal dropping back down to this, uh, uh, this background level. And this will continue until the next base that's correct binds, and you'll see another spike. And so by looking at these spikes and signals across anywhere from one to eight million wells at a time, we can build up DNA sequences. And PAC biosequencing generates long reads, anywhere from one to 200 kilobases in length. So this is shorter than the nanopore sequencing, but it's still much longer than Illumina sequencing. It also has a high error rate, similar to Oxford nanopore sequencing. 
but its errors are random. This is actually a good thing. Because the errors are random, if you sample the same DNA molecule several times, you can generate a very accurate consensus sequence. And on the top is a model of what a PAC bio library looks like. There's a DNA sequence, and the adapters in green actually cause the DNA to become this dumbbell shape. So it's one circular structure. And when a polymerase binds and starts a sequence, it actually go round and round this molecule many, many times, generating a series of, of reads that are all attached together that came from the same identical template. So for instance, if we have a mutation present in a sample and want to detect this, this mutation should be present in all the copies. And so if we match up all of the uh, different reads together that came from the same molecule, we can see that the true mutation is actually detected. We see that in every single read. And then other random errors that show up um, don't match up with each other. And this allows us to generate a very accurate consensus uh, that has an accuracy of anywhere from one to a thousand to one in 10,000 actually. So even exceeding raw Illumina sequencing accuracy. So why do long reads? Because there are certain downsides. They're harder to repair. In general, they cost more, but there are certain benefits. And one example is if you want to assemble a new genome that hasn't been sequenced before. And so this is kind of like solving a puzzle that's been either split into 10,000 pieces or into four pieces. Uh, in limited sequencing, and this is analogous to the 10,000 pieces because you have many, many short reads that you have to stitch together. And this can be very, very difficult. However, if you have very long reads and not that many of them, it's really easy to align them to rebuild this new genome that you want to assemble. It's also useful if you want to identify structural variations. So for instance, in a lot of human uh, cancer samples, uh, there aren't just single base changes in mutations. There are some that are structural variations where there are huge chunks of DNA that have been moved to different rare areas of the genome here or there or flipped around. And these can be very difficult to detect by short read Illumina sequencing. But if you have really long read sequencing, you can span these changes and then really easily identify the structural variations. Lastly, you might want to identify where mutations come from. For instance, in humans, we get one set of our chromosomes from mom, one set from dad. And there can be mutations on either one. Sometimes mutations might be on the same set of chromosomes. Some might be on either one. And to be able to do this with Illumina sequencing, again, is very difficult because the short reads make it hard to determine which chromosome they came from. But with long read sequencing, it's much easier to do so.